different sizes. As a matter of fact, we did the math. There are 67 different step family configurations. There's a lot of moving parts in blended families, and that creates a complexity. When uh, David and I first got together, he had three kiddos. I was very hands-off. I let him make all the parenting decisions. My daughter enjoyed having two sisters when they came, but it was hard because it wasn't the same for them. I didn't really feel like I was appreciated as a stepdad, so I started to find my place in ministry. Your imperfection is not a problem for God. You're not a second-class Christian because there's no such thing as a first-class Christian. There's just sinners who need a cross. You are redeemed, forgiven, made new, a child of God. It took a lot of prayer. It took a lot of communication between me and her, discussing and being on the same page of, hey, we're going to do this for our family. If I've learned anything, it's that I have no control, that I have to let go and let God, and accept that He's going to make a way. Our family was a mess, but look what God can do with us. He can make something out of anything. Marriage and family is one of God's greatest tools for growing us up. Relationships are a refining fire. They stretch us, mature us, and humble us, as long as we let them. I hope you'll let God stretch you a little bit in this series. Good morning, Faith. How you guys doing? How you guys doing? All right. <laughs> All right, let's get some announcements going. So we want to stay connected with you guys, so be sure to fill out the connection cards. You do have some of the yellow ones in the, fr in the seats in front of you, or if you have the Church Center app, you can fill out one of those um, on the app there. And th that video you just saw there is uh, a new group that we are introducing. It's a small group. It's called the smart, uh, the, the smart Step Family Small Group. It'll be starting June 29th through August 17th, and it'll be on Wednesdays from 6 to 8 p.m. And if you're interested, you can sign up on a Church Center app or let us know in the connection card if you're interested of, um, as well. And uh, Faith Family Camp is coming up at Camp Bayuka, and that will be on August 26th through the 28th. And registration is now open. So you guys could go ahead and, uh, and register for that. It was a great time. When I went last time, I caught my first fish for the first time last time. It was huge. This huge fish like this, right? It was... <laughs> That's pretty big, right? <laughs> no, it was, it was exciting. It was a great time. I had a lot of fun. Uh, my wife had a lot of fun. And uh, we're definitely going to go again this year. So hope to see you all there. Um, so Saturday, June 18th, we're doing a prayer at the Courthouse Park, uh, 9 to 9.30 a.m. Come and um, let's just pray together. It's, um, it's a great opportunity to just pray for one another, pray for the community. Um, so I hope to see you guys there. And uh, as we prepare our hearts for worship, uh, I want to share a verse with you guys. And it's uh, Psalms 100. Uh, verse 2, it says, worship the Lord with gladness. Come before him singing with joy. So as we prepare our hearts for worshiping, I just want you guys to meditate and think about that uh, verse there. It says, worship, uh, it says, come before him singing with joy. So I, I know we all can't sing. That's okay. I can't sing, right? But um, when, when uh, these guys are singing up here and doing their thing, um, join along with them and you know, and just let, you know, open your heart and let God know how you feel. Let these words penetrate your heart. All right, let's have some fun. One of the reasons why we can worship is because of God's mercy. His mercy for us when he sent his son so that we can have life. That is why we sing and worship this morning. That's why we sing and worship with our lives. Let's stand together as we worship him today. Praise the Lord, His mercy is born, stronger than darkness, new every morn, our sins they are many, His mercy is more, one love 
could remember no wrongs we have done. Omniscient, all knowing, He counts not their sum. Thrown into a sea without bottom or shore. Our sins, they are many, His mercy is more. Praise the Lord. would wait as we constantly roam. What Father so tender is calling us home. He welcomes the weakest, the vilest, the poor. Our sins, they are many. His mercy is more. Praise the Lord. He lavished on us His blood was the payment His life was the cost We stood beneath the debt We could never afford Our sins, they are many His mercy is more Praise the Lord His mercy is more is more. Praise the Lord. His mercy is born. Stronger than darkness through every morn. Our sins, they are many. His mercy is more. Our sins, they are many. His mercy is more. Our sins, they are many. His mercy is more. There's one reason why you and I are here this morning. That's because of what Jesus has done for us, what God did in sending His Son for you and I. When He did that, He showed us a mercy beyond what we can ever imagine or comprehend. And in doing so, He gave us a hope a hope that's greater than any hope that we can have here on earth. And that hope is Jesus Christ. There is a song I know it well melody that's never faint on mountains high valleys low my soul will rest my confidence in you alone hope has a name his name is Jesus my Savior's cross set the sinner free hope as a name his name is Jesus oh Christ we pray I have victory there'll be a light salvation's flame Christ undefeated Trample the grave. Sing now the cross. 
be lifted high. The light has come, the light has won. Behold the Christ. Oh, as a name, his name is Jesus, my Savior's cross has set the sinner free. Oh, as a name. Oh, Christ, be praised, I have victory. Hope has a name, His name is Jesus. My Savior's cross has set the sinner free. Hope has a name, His name is Jesus. Oh, Christ, be praised. home in glory your face I'll see my pain no more my fear will cease I bow my life I fix my eyes on Christ my King I bow my life I fix my eyes on Christ my King as a name, his name is Jesus. My Savior's cross has set the sinner free. Hope has a name, his name is Jesus. Oh, Christ be praised, I have victory.
anchor holds it we don't hold that truth lightly, but that we grab onto that with our whole being, that we live it out, that we live it in such a way that the entire world knows that we're different because of what you have done in us. So God, may we honor you, may we glorify you with our lives, may we give you all the, the praise and the glory that you deserve. God, it's you that we worship this morning. In your name we pray, amen. You may be seated. And we remember one such defining moment. Can anybody tell me what defining moment is celebrated tomorrow? D-Day. 
D-Day. Uh, many perhaps forget our history and how that changed our world. <coughs> you have to bear with me. I think I'm starting to lose my voice, so hopefully we'll make it through. You might be praying this will be a short sermon. <laughs> But D-Day is a pivotal battle in World War II when 133,000 British, American, and Canadian troops stormed the beaches of Normandy. 4,414 soldiers, allied soldiers, gave their lives on that day to fight for freedom. And their bravery, their sacrifice, helped turn the tide of the war, and eventually led to the liberation of Europe from the evils of Nazism. Now, it seems like a long way off from that, but what would our world be like today if Nazism actually controlled the world? Today? That was a defining moment in history. Defining moments. Our personal lives have them as well, don't they? Birthdays. Graduations. We celebrate a lot of those this time of the year. Weddings. Anniversaries. Perhaps you can look back at your life and there are significant defining moments for you. 30 years ago tomorrow, Kathy and I entered into a sacred covenant and began the adventure of a lifetime together as husband and wife. And wow, what a ride it has been. Yes. And I am so very thankful that I have the wonderful privilege to share the journey of life together with such a wonderful, godly woman as Kathy is. She's my best friend, and she's my soulmate, and I love her. Defining moments. I believe probably the most important defining moment in all of history is the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. It's the certainty of the resurrection that forms a foundation and shapes all that I believe about Jesus and the Bible and really all of my life. And as a result of the resurrection, you and I can experience God and life to the fullest, not only now, but for all eternity. But today, I'd like to talk about another defining moment in history. And this defining moment occurred 50 days after the resurrection of Jesus. 10 days after Jesus ascended to heaven. Today in the church, we celebrate it as what's called Pentecost. Today we celebrate the birth of Jesus' church. This is the third message in our series, Equip. And God has organized and equipped His church to spread the message of Jesus alive from the dead and carry out the mission of making more and becoming better followers of Jesus. And right before Jesus ascended into heaven, He gave His disciples this mission, which became the mission of the church, your mission, our mission. And so He gave them this mission to make more and become better followers of Jesus. And then he said, wait. Wait in Jerusalem until you receive the promise from the Father. What was that special promise that they were to wait for? Does anybody know? The Holy Spirit, I heard it there. That's right. The Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit was the promise that would enable them, would empower them, and equip them to carry out the mission He had given them. 
In fact, uh, this is what Jesus said. Dr. Luke records this, Acts chapter 1. He says, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my eyewitnesses. He's talking specifically to these disciples that he had just spent 40 days proving that he was alive from the dead. You will be my eyewitnesses in Jerusalem, in all Judea, in Samaria, and to the end of the earth. So Jesus ascended to heaven and the disciples, they devoted themselves to prayer and they waited. And 10 days later, they're gathered together in the upper room and probably was the same room where they celebrated the Last Supper together. And this is what happened. We read in Acts chapter 2. And when the day of Pentecost arrived, They were all together in one place, and suddenly there came from heaven a sound like a mighty rushing wind, and it filled the entire house where they were sitting. And divided tongues as a fire appeared on them, and they rested on each of them, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit, and they began to speak in other tongues, in foreign languages, as the Spirit gave them utterance. Now, if you go back in Jewish history, the day of Pentecost was a very special celebration for the nation of Israel. It was specifically a day when they gave thanks to God for the blessings of the harvest, much like we celebrate our Thanksgiving today. Pentecost, the word actually means 50, and this feast comes 50 days after the Feast of First Fruits. It's also Pentecost is called the, the Feast of Weeks. By the way, I believe God was very intentional in choosing various feasts as it relates to Jesus and his ministry. I want you to think about this. God chose Passover symbolically to be the time when Jesus, the Lamb of God, would die for you and me and give himself as a sacrifice to take away the sin of the world. So you have Passover in the Old Testament, and really that was a symbol of what Jesus would do for you and me. And then we have Jesus when he rose from the dead. He rose from the dead on the feast of first fruits. Why is that significant? Well, Paul says this in 1 Corinthians chapter 15 that Jesus is the first fruits of those who will be raised from the dead. And God also chose this particular day, the day of Pentecost, 50 days after the resurrection, to set apart another group of people for his name, the church. You see, for the nation of Israel, not only was it a harvest celebration, but they also celebrate it as the giving of the law. In other words, It was also a celebration on the day of Pentecost when Israel as a nation received the ten words. We know of them as the Ten Commandments at Mount Sinai. And it was at that time that God made Israel as a nation his people. Now, here in the church, 50 days later, he's calling another people to be his. The church. And here's how it happened. The Holy Spirit came on these followers of Jesus. And they went out in the power of the Spirit. And they flooded the streets. And they began to share the message of Jesus alive from the dead. And here's what was so unique. is that The disciples miraculously were able to tell all of the people about Jesus in their own foreign languages. See, this was the one feast, where, one of three feasts, where all the male individuals in, in the nation of Israel were required to journey to Jerusalem. And so you had Jewish people from all over the world had gathered in Jerusalem. And they they were now hearing these disciples who had never learned their language speak to them about Jesus in their own foreign language. I mean, uh, students, think about that, this. If in high school you're learning a foreign language, I learned a little bit of Spanish, but Think about this, if you didn't actually have to learn it, you could just speak it. Wouldn't that be great? Yeah. Well, that's what happened to these guys. And the crowd, because they knew the Jewish scriptures, 
they understood what they, this meant. They understood that these uneducated men speaking in their own foreign tongues, their own foreign languages, that it actually, according to the book of Isaiah, was a sign of God's judgment on them. Isaiah talks about hearing in foreign languages as a sign of judgment. And Peter gets up and they're asking, what does this mean? And Peter gets up and he he shares how Jesus came as the Messiah, the promised deliverer, but they had rejected him and killed him. However, Peter shares with them this was all part of God's perfect plan for Jesus to pay the price and die for your sins and mine in order to rescue us. And death couldn't keep Jesus because God raised him up from the dead, brought him back to life, and exalted him. And after they heard Peter's words, they were cut in their hearts. And they accepted his eyewitness testimony And they began to say, what do we do? And so this is what Peter said. Pay attention. Peter said, go to church regularly. No, that's not what he said, is it? No. Peter tells them how to become followers of Jesus. Look at verse 38. By the way, I want to encourage you to go back and read through the whole chapter of Acts chapter 2 for the whole story there. And Peter said to them, repent, turn, and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for, because of, that's what the word for means, the forgiveness of your sins. And you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. And this is what happened, verse 41. So those who received his word, they believed in Jesus, they became followers, They were baptized, and there were added that day about 3,000 souls, 3,000 people. What an amazing time. This was opening day. This was the birth of the church. Now, most people, when they think about church, they think about going to church or attending church. They think of church as a building. But that would not have made any sense to the people on that day. They had no church building. And as we've learned the last couple of weeks, church simply means assembly. It means a gathering of people. The church is people. Who is the church? We are the church. That's right. You and I are the church. And so the church is a gathering, a group of people centered around the message of Jesus, alive from the dead, with the mission of making more and becoming better followers of Jesus. The church is people, not a building. But you might be thinking, wait a minute, nowhere in Acts chapter 2 do you actually see the word church. So how do you know that the church actually began on the day of Pentecost? I'm glad you asked that. So let's take a look. Right before this event, when Jesus was speaking to his disciples, he said this, Acts chapter 1, verse 5, John baptized you with water, but you will be baptized with what? The Holy Spirit, not many days from now. Now that word baptized is a transliteration. It actually comes from the Greek word baptizo. See, baptize, baptizo, They just took the English letters and put them to the Greek word. But it actually means to place into. Just like deacon simply means servant. This here, baptize, means to place into. And this is what we read in Acts chapter 11. Peter is speaking. The gospel is going to the Gentiles. And there's a sign that this was God's work. And so this is what we read, Acts chapter 11. And I began, I, Peter, began to speak, and the Holy Spirit fell on them just just as on us at the beginning. When was the beginning? Back in Acts 2, Pentecost, when the Holy Spirit came upon them. And I remembered the word of the Lord, how he said, John baptized with water, placed people into water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. Now, now what is this baptism of the Holy Spirit? Because there's all sorts of different beliefs out there about it. But the baptism of the Holy Spirit, Paul clearly tells us what it is. 
In 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 13, he says this, For in one spirit we were all baptized, placed into one body. Now, let me ask you, what is the body? What is that one body? Christ is the, who's the head of the church? Jesus, right? And the head has a body. The body of Jesus is the church. And this is what happens that when uh, what happened on that day is the Spirit of God placed these believers into the body of Christ, the church. That's what to be Spirit baptized means. So on the day of Pentecost, the followers of Jesus were baptized by the Holy Spirit. Literally, they were placed into the body of Christ, the church. This was the birth of the church. And then the Holy Spirit equipped them and empowered them to go out and carry out the mission of the church. So you might be asking, well, how do I become a part of the body of Christ, the church? Well, Peter tells us. He says this, repent. Now that that word repent seems like a very churchy word, doesn't it? But it simply means to turn to turn away from your sin, to turn from the wrongs you've done and follow Jesus. And so when you admit your sin, and we've all done wrong, we've all sinned. Our sin, we admit, it separates us from a holy God. And when you believe that Jesus died on the cross, was buried and came back to life, and when you call out on him and ask him to save and forgive and lead you, whoever calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. So when you, when you cross that line of faith and you call out on him and ask him to save you, at that very moment, the Holy Spirit takes you and places you into the body of Christ, the church. If you're a follower of Jesus, you're a part of the church. And the Holy Spirit permanently indwells you and he equips you to carry out his mission. So what is this church that you've been called, been a part of? We call it the universal church. We call it positional membership in the universal church. The universal church really is, it's made up of all followers of Christ from the day of Pentecost until the day of the rapture when, when Jesus comes back for his people. That's the universal church. However, there's another type of church membership. So if you're a follower of Jesus, you're already a part of his church, the universal church. Following me on that? Go like this if you're following. Okay. All right. Now there's a a second type of church membership that the, the Bible also talks about. And we call this local church membership or participating membership. So you have positional membership, that's all followers of Jesus. And then you have or positional membership, then you have part participating membership. One is the universal, the other is the local church. When you read the scriptures, the Christian scriptures, we call them mostly the New Testament, they were written to the local churches, specific churches. Let me give you an example. Uh, the letter to the Corinthians was written to the church of God at... Corinth, that was a local church. The church of the Thessalonians. Uh, The church in in Revelation, it talks about seven different churches. The church in Ephesus and Smyrna and Pergamum and Thyatira and Sardis and Philadelphia and Laodicea. Uh, You read in the scriptures, it talks about the churches of Galatia. Galatia was a region. So not just one church, but several local churches in Galatia. The churches of Judea, the churches of Macedonia, those were regions. So local churches are the visible gathering of the universal church. Let me help you uh, understand it this way. You and I, we cannot see the invisible bond of positional membership. Once you're a follower of Jesus... Um, You can see the fruits of that in our lives, but it's invisible. And sometimes the universal church is called the invisible church. 
However, we can identify those who are participating members of a local church. That's the visible sign of the universal church. So you might be asking this, why is participating membership, why is it so important to be a participating member in a local church? I mean, think about it. If I'm already a a follower of Jesus and a positional member of the universal church, why does God want me to be a participating member in a local church? I think that's a really good question, don't you? So let's start by looking at the biblical pattern for local church membership. Participating in a local church is the biblical pattern for followers of Jesus. Now, you will never find the term church member in the Bible. But the concept is implicit. Let me explain. Acts chapter 2, verse 41. Let's go back there. Those who received his word, they believed, they became followers of Jesus, were baptized. Now here, that's talking about water baptism as opposed to spirit baptism, which is different. And there were, what's the word? Say it with me added that day about 3,000 people. Here's a question. What were they added to? The church. Yeah. They were added to the church, and how were they added to the church? Well, there are two requirements for local church membership. First thing is they believed. They became a follower of Jesus. They received his word. They repented. And second of all, they were baptized. This is believers' water baptism. So they first believed in Jesus, then they went public with their faith, which water baptism doesn't save anyone. Rather, it's uh, going public to say, I am already a follower of Jesus. And so they went public with their faith through believers' water baptism. And only after these two steps were they added to the local church. And that's why... Here at Faith, we practice what we call saved, baptized church membership. The first step is that you're a follower of Jesus. You've made a conscious decision, not that you were baptized as a baby, because you couldn't decide to be a follower of Jesus at that point. So you, as a follower of Jesus, made a conscious decision first to trust Christ, and then second, you were baptized afterwards And then you are added to the church. We also see in Scripture that followers of Jesus clearly identified themselves with a specific local body of believers. In other words, they clearly knew who was a part of the church and who wasn't. Let me give you an example. Last week in Acts 6, uh, we talked about the apostles told the church to choose from among you individuals to be church servants. Well, how did they know who was a part of them and who wasn't? They, they, there was something, when it says among you, there, were, there was a type of membership. Maybe not exactly as we practice it today, but they knew who was a part and who wasn't. 1 Corinthians chapter 5, Paul is talking to the church. There was somebody that was involved in a very public sin. And they were, they were putting up with it. And so Paul talks to them about uh, church discipline and dismissing this individual from their from their congregation, and he talks about uh, um, the person who was among them, who was part of them, and then he says that we don't judge those who are outside, only those who are inside, literally within. So how do you know who is within the church and who isn't? Well, those who are members. We also see their devotion to one another in the local church. They carried out the one another commands. Well, how do you do that? How do you know who's the church? Local church membership. Like Hebrews 10, 24 and 25. Let us consider how to stir up one another in love and good works, not neglecting to meet together as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another and all the more as you see the day drawing near. See, it's within the local church that you carry out these one another's. And then within the context of the local church, participating members use their gifts and abilities 
and they serve one another, and they care for one another. Romans chapter 12, Paul says this, as in one body we have many members, and the members do not have the same function. There's diversity. We have different roles that we play within the church. Uh, So we, though many, are one body in Christ and individually members one of another. Where do we carry out those gifts and abilities? Within the local church. Now, let me ask you. Can you serve without being a participating member of a local church? Of course you can. Sure you can. But it also limits the types of things that you can do. So we see there's a a biblical pattern for membership, but there are also some practical reasons for membership. In our our cultural situation, I believe it becomes very important to differentiate between those who have made a commitment to the church and just those who attend the services of the church. Let me use this illustration. Think about this, uh, being a guest in someone's home or maybe having a guest in your home. Uh, you invite them over, what do you do? You kind of lay out the red carpet for them. Uh, maybe you use the good dishes for them. Uh, they, they don't really do anything. They, they, you just, you're getting to know them. They might be a little uncomfortable, not sure what to expect, right? Now think about this. Is there a difference between having a guest in your home and having a friend in your home? Sure there is. You know, the friend comes in and you say, hey, there's the fridge, help yourself right? Yeah, there's, there's a difference between a friend in your home and a guest in your home. And then think about the difference between a friend and a family member. You know, it, there may be things you expect from your friend, but probably not too much, right? But when it comes to a family member, a family works together, does, doesn't it? There are certain responsibilities within a family, uh, there are certain chores within a family. Uh, young people, there's a reason that you have certain chores. We all participate in part, being part of that family. And think about that illustration within, with, with reference to the church. We have guests that come in each week. And they're not sure what to expect. And we let, you know, roll out the red carpet for them and help them feel comfortable. Then there are friends, regular tenders that come in, and they're a part of us, and we just we love each other and just enjoy having a good time, but there, there's, we don't really expect them to necessarily, we invite them to, to do things, but they haven't made an official commitment to the church and the mission of the church. And then we have family members. Those who covenant together, who, who make a commitment to one another. And we'll talk about that in a little bit more. So there are different levels of commitment within the church. And so participating membership in a local church is really just a practical way to officially identify and show one's commitment to a local group of followers of Jesus. By the way, it's also a very valuable tool for the leaders of the church to know who we're responsible for. God says that we're going to give an account for those that we are to shepherd, to those we are to care for, to lead, to to equip, to teach. Well, who are we supposed to care for? So let's start with the practical reasons for membership. Let's talk about care. Membership clarifies the primary group of individuals that the church and its leadership are to care for and be concerned about. Now, do we care and are we concerned about everyone? Of course. But those who are committed family members receive priority in the allocation of finite church resources. We can't care for everyone, so who specifically? Those who have made a commitment to the local church. The second practical reason is responsibility. Who's responsible for the mission of the church? Well, a participating member not only enjoys the blessings of being a part of the church and its ministries, but also re- accepts responsibility for the church and its mission. They commit to actively attend and participate and connect in small groups and grow and serve and pray and give financially and support the work of the church, their family. 
participating membership helps the church leaders be able to practically identify those who are truly committed to build and sustain the mission and the ministries of the church. We don't expect necessarily attenders to do that. They're certainly welcome to help out. But that's the role of being a practicing member. And finally, the third uh, reason, practical reason for local church uh, membership is governance. Governance. See, under Jesus, who who is the head of the church? Jesus is the head of the church. See, under the head of the church, Jesus, we believe that the authority of the local church is vested in participating members of the local church. We call this congregationalism or congregational government. Let me just explain how that works. Like in our church, it's the participating church members who select their spiritual leaders. You select your elders, overseers, pastors. It's the participating members who elect their officers, their church servants. Those are one and the same. You do that as a congregation. As a congregation, as participating members, you approve the annual budget and you vote on other major decisions. Also, according to the state of New York, the state of New York recognizes churches if they have credible membership and organization. And that's where governance comes in. We believe in elder-led, pastor-led congregationalism as we see it in Scripture. Now, today we talked about last week of answering some of your questions on some of the the draft proposal amendments for our Constitution. And uh, we received a sum total of three questions. So I'll keep this short, all right? And uh, we, we seek, we invite your input on this. Uh, the first question was with reference to membership and dismissal of membership. In Article chapter or Article 6, it talks about membership. And somebody asks under dismissal of membership, why does it not list A, B, and C? And the reason is because those are unchanged. The only thing that was, would be changed with changing pastors and deacons to the oversight team in D. How does that relate to governance? Well, it's the church that would be responsible for dismissing a member. That's part of congregationalism. Matthew chapter 18 makes very clear, if your brother sins, you go to him in private. If he does not change, then if he doesn't listen, then you take uh, two or three with you. The oversight team comes in and helps out with that as well. And then it says this, if he still doesn't listen, then tell it to the church, not the oversight team, but the church. Who is that? The participating members. And if he still does not listen, then it says that, uh, that he is to be put out of the church. And that we find in 1 Corinthians chapter 5. And who does that? Well, it's the church. And so uh, that's, that's the first question that was asked. So if you don't see anything listed here, then it remains unchanged. All right, that helps, I think, answer that question. Another question that came in was this. Um, does the current service and time serve for deacon count towards time as elder, or are they starting fresh? There are certainly our deacons. Many of them are qualified or potentially qualified to be elders. And, uh, but elders is a different role than deacon. And so it would start fresh. Uh, we are recommending a year transitional team to make sure that all of those who are elected into that role are qualified as elders. So there'd be a year training Um, But I certainly would see some of our deacons becoming elders, uh, for sure. But it would start fresh, their term at that point. Um, And then the final question was, would church servants, would they, um, would church servants be the only ones who do the work, or will volunteers help out as well? And... uh, Certainly, the the church servants would be in charge of those areas such as care or building and grounds or stewardship, 
but certainly they wouldn't be the only ones involved in doing those things. If they were the only ones involved, uh, it probably would not get done. So they would involve, we would continue to involve volunteers as well. But those that you elect as church servants would be in charge of those areas. Uh, we certainly are seeking and invite more of your input. So uh, please uh, keep your suggestions coming. Uh, next Sunday night, not tonight, but a week from uh, this Sunday night, we're going to have an open forum. And you'll have an opportunity to discuss the draft proposals. And then next October, we won't vote on anything It'll be next October that we would vote on these proposed changes. So lots of time, lots of time for feedback and input and prayer, and most importantly, the study of God's Word, because we want to align ourselves in what we do with what God says. The third reason for participating in local church membership, I believe, is the spiritual benefits for you. The spiritual benefits. See, participating membership spiritually benefits you as a follower of Jesus. In Ephesians chapter 4, we read this. And he, Jesus, gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the shepherd teachers, pastor teachers, to equip the saints. Who are the saints? We are, the churches, to do the work of ministry, to do the work of service. Who is to do the ministry? We are, all of us. For the building up of the body of Christ. Until we all attain to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge and the experience of the Son of God. That's what the word knowledge means. It's not just a head knowledge. It's an experience of Jesus in your life. To a mature manhood, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. So that we may no longer be children tossed to and fro by the waves carried about by every wind of doctrine, by human cunning, by craftiness and deceitful schemes. Rather speaking the truth in love. We are together to grow up in every way into Him who is the head, into Christ. Who's the head of the church? Christ Jesus. From whom the whole body is joined and held together by what every joint by every joint with which it is equipped. When each part, that's you, that's me, is working properly, makes the body grow so that it builds itself up in love. So the first spiritual benefit that you receive by becoming a part of a local church is you will grow spiritually. Think about this. If, if you're all by yourself, you know, there are a lot of people, well, I can just believe in Jesus. I don't have to be connected with anyone else. That is dangerous. You're a perfect target for the enemy when you're all by yourself and all alone as, to be, as opposed to being part of God's family and together as a group. Uh, it, there's a reason he talks about the schemes and the cunning because we're in a spiritual war and it's very dangerous to be out there on your own. In a second, uh, in a culture where commitment to anything, a job, a marriage, whatever, is no longer highly valued. Membership is a positive step in your spiritual growth, especially as you commit to share life together with each other. Membership goes against the, the current trend of selfishness. It's a, it's a selfless commitment, and commitment builds character. And in this sense, I believe that participating membership can be a defining moment in your life. And in your journey of becoming like Jesus, of living like Jesus and loving like Jesus, because we journey together. But not only does it help you in your spiritual growth, your personal growth, it helps you, it gives you personal fulfillment. Think about this. Now, it's, it's quite e easy just to attend service and, at, and events at a church, just be a recipient, a taker, Right? However, that's not what God has called us to be. One of the greatest means of fulfillment as a follower of Jesus is by serving and giving. What did Jesus say? It's more blessed to give than to receive. And then finally, it helps with personal accountability. Personal accountability. Something I need and something you need. All of us have blind spots, don't we? 
And all of us need a, a friend, somebody who cares about us, who's when we're heading down the wrong path and we're going to get hurt, someone who loves us enough to come alongside of us and say, hey, you keep going down this path, you're going to get hurt. Don't do it. And that's what the church is. We need each other. It, it helps us be accountable, and it's essential to maintain the purity of the church and guard the doctrine of the church. So becoming a member of faith is a choice. It's a choice to begin a journey of sharing life with other followers of Jesus. It, commits, it, it communicates your commitment to share life together in the context of spiritual community. It allows you to use your abilities and talents to the fullest and together carry out the mission of making more and becoming better followers of Jesus. So you might be asking, well, how do, be how do I become a participating member at faith? Well, first, if the first step is you believe. You trust Jesus as your Savior. You become a follower of Jesus. Second, you go public with your faith through believer's water baptism. Third, you let us know you're interested. And you can do that simply on your card right here. It says, I'm interested in becoming a church member. And you go ahead and check that. You can also do that on your digital connection card. We'll get in touch with you and we'll have you fill out an application. Uh, you'll share with us how you came to know Jesus and uh, uh, your baptism as well. And then you would attend a uh, Exploring Faith Seminar, which tells you, uh, goes through, Dave teaches it, and he shares with you the privileges and responsibilities of what it means to be a member. No commitment at that point. By the way, even if you're not interested in participating in membership, you're a tender of our church, we welcome you to be a part of that, to really find out uh, our heart and, and why we do what we do. I'd encourage you to be a part of that. Well, let's go back to Acts chapter 2. Verse 41 says, Those who received his word and baptized, and there were added that day about what? 3,000 souls. 3,000 people. Can you imagine what it must have been like to be there on that day when the church was born? I mean, it was big. It was a defining moment in history. The church of Jerusalem went, grew 3,000 people that day from 120 to 3,120. That had to be so exciting to be there. And then we read this. This is what the church did. They then devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, to the Word of God. And the fellowship. Now, fellowship wasn't a potluck dinner. Fellowship, actually, the word means partnering together. Partnering in the mission that God had given them. To the breaking of bread, which refers to participating in communion and prayers. And then we read this in verse 46. And day by day they attended the temple together and breaking bread in their homes, again celebrating the Lord's table. Uh, they received their food with glad and generous hearts. They had what was called a love feast together with communion. And they praised God and had favor with all the people. And the Lord added to their number day by day those who were being saved. In a moment, we're going to come together as God's chosen people, the church, and celebrate communion. So what I'd like you to do is go ahead and take out your elements. If you didn't receive them on the way in, they're back on the table. Go ahead and you can pick those up now or... Those of you that are watching online, you can get the elements ready where you're at there. And please wait. We're going to eat and drink together. Participating in communion doesn't save anyone. Taking these elements doesn't save anyone. Uh, Peter was very clear. How, how are you saved? It's by becoming a follower of Jesus, by turning to Him. Rather, when, when we take this, this is, it's a memorial a way for those who have made a faith commitment to Jesus to remember his death on the cross that paid the penalty for you and me for our sins. Specifically this morning, as we participate in communion, I want you to think and focus on Jesus' death in relation to his church. 
Ephesians 5, 25, we read this. Husband, love your wa- husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the what? Church. And gave himself up for her. Who does her refer to? The church. The church. That he might sanctify her, the church, having cleansed her, the church, by the washing of water with the word. So that he might present what? The church to himself in splendor, without spot or wrinkle or any such thing, that she, the church, might be holy and without blemish. Now normally we look at this passage and we say, well, this this helps us understand marriage and what God wants from husbands and what God wants for wives, and that's true. But that's only an illustration. Paul later says, I I speak of the mystery of Christ and the church. You see, Jesus deeply loves his church. And we're not talking about an institution. The church is people, right? The church is people set apart for Jesus. A people called to share in his message of hope and forgiveness to the world around us. That's the church. You're his church. Jesus died so that you would be his church. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for Jesus Christ who loves his church, gave himself up, gave his body for his church, gave himself so that we could be part of his church. Thank you, Jesus. Luke chapter 22, verse 19, we read that he took the bread And when he had given thanks, he broke it, and he gave it to them, saying, this is my body which is given for you. See, he gave himself up for you, his church. Do this in remembrance of me. The wafer here represents the body of Jesus. It doesn't actually become the body. It's a memorial that Jesus gave himself up for you and me. He gave his body for you, his church. And in light of that, let us take and eat together. Now go ahead and take the cup. The cup of juice here represents the blood of Jesus Christ. And it's the blood he shed to purchase his church. Interesting, in Acts chapter 20, verse 28, when Paul is giving his farewell message to the leaders of the church there in Ephesus, he says this, pay careful attention to yourselves, to all the flock in which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers, to care for the what? Church of God, which he obtained with his blood. Who did Jesus shed his blood for? Us, the church. You see, it's through the blood of Jesus that you and I have been forgiven, that we've been redeemed, that we've been set free from sin, that we've been purchased to belong to God as his people, the church of God. Now, here we're talking about that universal church of all followers of Jesus. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for the blood of Jesus Christ. It's through the blood that we receive the forgiveness of sins. And it's through the blood of Jesus that we are made a part of your body, the church. Thank you, Jesus. In Jesus' name, amen. And likewise, the cup after they had eaten, saying, this cup that is poured out for you is the new covenant. My new relationship with you in my blood. Let us take and drink together. This week, let's together remember the love that Jesus has for his church. And by the way, if Jesus loves his church and gave himself, sacrificed himself for the church, don't you think we should love his church as well? I think we should. 
And if you're a follower of Jesus, you're a part of the church, the universal church. And God wants you to be the church. And if you're positionally a member of the universal church as a follower of Jesus, why not consider becoming a participating member of the local church here at Faith? It may be a defining moment in your life. As we bring the service to a close, most often we give our members an opportunity to give to the mission of our church. And we don't expect our guests to give. Remember the difference between guest attenders and members? Uh, This is for our members. Uh, You you may give if you want, but we don't want you to feel any pressure. Um, Jesus gave himself up for the church. And that's why we love the church and and why we give as well. We give because he gave. And we give because we we first give ourselves in worship, but we also give our money to the mission to carry out the work of the church. We feel that's part of our responsibility as well. And so we encourage you, if you're a member, also if you're a tender, we welcome you to, to give toward the mission of the church. And you can do that on your way out in the bucket or simply online. And as we close the service, uh, we're going to have a video here um, that talks about going back to church. And he's not just talking about a building. He's talking about being a part of the, the people of God, the church. There was a time that